thank you for hosting me and for uh, sharing your lunch with me. Uh, and I hope I will, in this uh, short presentation, inspire you and um, also to um, tell you how you can change the world student by student. Um, so um, here in this picture, you see uh, an image where our beloved Hubble Space Telescope sits over the Earth. And yes, the Earth is round, it's not flat. <laughs> so um, I start with this joke, but this joke is actually um, something for us to reflect. Uh, somehow, scientists and educators have failed. We have failed teaching the young people critical thinking and scientific method. Why am I saying this? I mean, I'm saying this because I never thought in the 21st century I would have to teach people that the earth is not flat, okay? I would not have to convince people that vaccines are good for you. So this is a failure in education. And this is part, probably the only very serious thing I'm gonna tell you during your lunch. But I think it's something that I really want you to reflect. And it's because of this that I do a lot of outreach, that I teach young people the beauty of science and how science can change people's life and enrich them as human beings. Our planet is hurting. We need to help our planet. We need people to care. And that's why I do the work I do with children in Brazil, and that's part of the end of my talk. So let's start from the beginning. I'm gonna start telling you what happened to me when I say I'm an astrophysicist. Most of the time, big people think I'm a fortune teller. <laughs> I do horoscopes, but they tell me their signs, and they expect me to do their map. And no, I'm not a, an astrologist. I'm not a, a fortune teller. Sometimes people think that I'm an astrophysicist, so I must be a genius. I'm not a genius. I study hard, and I'm good at learning. So I am an astrophysicist. So um, sometimes when you want to drive people away from conversations, you also bring that word into the, and they go away. <laughs> but most of the people, when they realize I say I'm an astrophysicist, they immediately react by the fact that, wow, you must be the only female astrophysicist. Yes, it is a male dominant field. How many of you know another astrophysicist? Yes, be because you live in a place where there are many of us. There are many of us here in this region of the country. Okay, this region of the US has the highest concentration of astrophysicists in the world. Did you know that? And it has to do with NASA. It has to do with Johns Hopkins. It has to do with the University of Maryland and other higher education, including Catholic University, where we have astrophysicists. So that's why. So um, here's a picture. I know it's a little, um, it's an old picture, right? Um, there are four generations in this picture. I'm the little one. So um, here's my great-grandmother. Her name was Fortunate, Fortunata. This woman left Italy at age 16 with her sister, who was younger, to move to Brazil to work in a clothes factory. I find very inspirational the stories of immigrants of that time. Remember, she went on a boat from another continent to arrive in a country. She knew nothing about it because there was no internet. And the encyclopedias were probably very rare there too. This is in the late 1800s. So my great grandmother had 13 children. She married a Portuguese man in Brazil and they had 13 children. This is one of them, is my grandmother. So my grandmother was not the oldest, not the youngest, she was right in the middle of the pack. And she, this grandmother is probably the woman with the best vibe I ever, ever met. So I probably inherited a lot of her 
because she liked to, to tell other jokes and so did I since at that age. So, and this is my mother. So my mother was not, she was, um, she had three siblings, a sister and two brothers. Um, she had a very tough life. Uh, she also had four children. And she had my father who was an alcoholic and a troublemaker. So she had one mission in her life. And that mission was that we all had to study. So you can imagine how it was at home, right? So that's my sister. My sister's an architect uh, and um, um, security engineer, and she just retired. So we are a family of four as well. My brother is an engineer, and my past brother was a medical doctor. So we all went to the universe. So my, my mother did not think the sky was the limit. She really thought that we will, would go there and conquer, and that's what was her mission. So here I am in public school in Rio de Janeiro, where I grew up. And whenever you want to find me, look for the teacher. I'm next to the teacher. <laughs> so here I am. <laughs> so this is a, a school, public school in the 70s. This picture is from 1970. And uh, this is where I learned how to read and write. When I learned how to read and write, my life changed. Because at that point, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I did not know how to re read until I was six years old. So I learned how to read at this school with these classmates. So it, it is a, a, an interesting part of my life. Then I was a normal kid. Well, not really. I was a geeky kid. So I love science fiction. I grew up, and I can tell you the old ones here because they know all of this. So um, I grew up watching this. You know, TV was a big thing in the 70s, right? So we all watched TV, and that's pretty much the entertainment we had at home because we had no money for anything else. So TV, that was it. Um, and I did go to the movies sometimes, and I was totally in love with uh, Luke Skywalker here, because I was too young to like uh, the captain. Um, and I totally loved this family, family, family Robinson, do you remember this? I uh, lost in, um, in space. Uh, I was not in love with this one. I was in love with the father figure of this guy. Because wow, imagine a family with a father like that. I was just amazed. And of course, I was in, I was in love with the jerk, Captain Kirk. Um, but remember, there were geniuses here, right? Spock was a genius. Um, and I was in love, really, with this man. So this is Carl Sagan. So Carl Sagan had a, a program on TV called Cosmos, for those who don't know. Um, and Cosmos, for me, was just unbelievable. And I wanted to know the universe just like Carl Sagan did. So I went to study. But first I had to convince my family that I was not going to starve to death, as, as Isabel said before. Because when I told my mom that I wanted to do an astronomy course, that I wanted to be an astronomer, she asked me, astro que? <laughs> what? <laughs> And um, she was expecting me to do just like my older brothers and my sister. And I decided that I did not want to do that. But Isabel must tell you that my dad really wanted me to be a dentist. Okay. But I said, eh, I like the sky out there, but not the mouth. So I wanted to go and study the universe. And I, my mom was a wonderful person. She took me to the place where they had astronomy course in Rio. And if you, uh, many people have been to Rio here? Probably not, no? but a couple have. So uh, Rio is a beautiful city with a lot of beaches, but it has a lot of strange neighborhoods too. Downtown Rio is particularly interesting. It's an old town that is from the 1700s, and in the middle of this old town, there is a little, bit, a little green area here where there's an observatory. So it's in the top of the hill, and this is the hill going up. Uh, it's on the top of the hill, and as you get there, you're exhausted, and you're also very lucky that you didn't get robbed. 
So, <laughs> so my mom wasn't particularly impressed with this place where her daughter was going to study astronomy for four years. Um, then I told her that I really wanted to do astronomy. I was in love with the atomic clock. This atomic clock showed up in science fiction. So I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. The, the official hour of Brazil comes from this box. I was amazed by this. So I, and she told me, where are you going to get a job? And I told her, well, look at the professors at the university. They're astronomers. They have jobs. Then she could relate to it. So people do not understand what researchers do. Uh, and they still don't. So many years have passed. This is from the 70s, right? And people still don't know what astronomers are, what researchers do. So I told my mom that I would become a professor, and I did. So um, here is, a, you know, what pictures that we had lots of hair at that time. <laughs> <laughs> so here is us in the 80s. Here's me. I'm always the tallest and used to be the skinny. But, um, and uh, women on the picture. You see, we were a group of 20 students, five women. We realized that we were in minority there, but we didn't think about it too much. And here's again me in the physics department at the university with a bunch of friends too. So we had role models. And this is one of the messages that I want you to take today, is that become a role model for the people you care. I have role models, and these are three of them, the three professors at the university that I looked up and I said, wow, these are giant women. I want to be like them. This is from an article that was in a magazine a few years later showing the three professors and this woman in the middle was the first woman to ever be a director of an observatory in Brazil. And they made the headline news of a magazine telling how much they thought of the new path that this observatory was going. So I thought they were awesome, and I wanted to be just like them. Then I had to decide what I was going to study as a researcher. And I decided to do. So I'm not just an astrophysicist. I'm an extragalactic astrophysicist. <laughs> so people really go away when I say this, right? <laughs> so I'm an extragalactic astrophysicist because I study galaxies. I never wanted, remember I said I wanted to know the universe just like I was saying. I never wanted to study the moon or the sun or, or the planets. I wanted to study things that were really far away. So these galaxies, the Andromeda galaxy, is a galaxy that's not so far from us. It's a neighbor. We're in the local group of galaxies. And the sun is in an area like this. Uh, we don't have a picture of the Milky Way because we have never been outside the Milky Way because of the distance. We cannot do, take a selfie with the Milky Way <laughs> because of the distances and the sizes, right? So uh, this is just to show that we look just like this. Our galaxy looks like this. And this is what I wanted to study. And so I did. I did a master's degree in that. And I, and I just do not want to study just galaxies. I want to study colliding galaxies. So that's what I do. And they pay me to do that. Is that cool? <laughs> so um, they've been doing that for 25 years. So, <laughs> so I guess I did it correctly. So colliding galaxies are some things like this. So the galaxies that are passing through each other, it's, it's almost like a ballet. Gravity holds them together. They go around each other. They transform each other. And at some point, depending on how they, atta they attack each other, they will actually become one galaxy at the end. So this is what I study in my PhD. And this is what my research is about, galaxies that collide. So. I went to study gal coll collisions of galaxies in many observatories in the world. But this is the first one I went, and this is me with short hair. Um, and this picture is taken in 1991 in Chile at the European Observatory in the Atacama Desert. And I'm on the top of a, uh, a, a building. There's a telescope that sits below here. 
So here's the building. Um, and actually, um, Isabel, Tommy took this picture. So um, I met my husband in this trip. So um, this is, um, was my first time in an observatory abroad, but I lived in the US at the time. I was uh, studying part of my PhD in the US. So I um, entered the cafeteria of this observatory. It's a pretty large observatory. It's the European largest observatory. And just like Isabel, when we enter something, we are always smiling, right? <laughs> they were Brazilians. We smile all the time. So here I am. I open the door. I enter the cafeteria. And everybody looked. I mean, every man looked. There were no women. Well, if there were, I didn't see them. So it was the first time in my life. This is how probably, President, you're feeling now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how I felt that day. And that day, I started realizing that, wow, we are really minorities. So I continue with my role models. I continue not to put them in, use that to put me down, but to put me up. So I had other role models. One of them is this lady here that, that's why I call them super women, because my advisor, a man, told me once that this woman was a superwoman. And she is a superwoman. She's now a friend of mine, but she's a French astronomer. She's amazing. Her productivity is incredible. If you send Francoise an email and she doesn't reply in five minutes, something's wrong. It doesn't matter what time of the day, what day of the week, she's always online. And this has been like this for 30 years. So Francoise is a superwoman. She's one of the most known astronomers, and she works with colliding galaxies as well. Beatrice is a Brazilian woman, although she's blonde and blue-eyed. Uh, Beatrice uh, is, a, is a professor at the University of Sao Paulo, and she is amazing. And she's really well-known in Brazil. She's currently the secretary of the Union, Astronomical Union, International Astronomic Union. She's really famous. So I always said, when I grow up, I want to be just like them. So they were my professors. But my supervisor is this lady here, Zulema Abraham. She was my master's supervisor in Sao Paulo. Fantastic woman who immigrated from Argentina because of the dictatorship in Argentina in the 60s. So uh, she was also a role model for me, and I really respected her work. So here I am back at that observatory. Remember, that one is 1991. Now it's 1997. There are some years that have a huge impact in your life, and you only realize that later on. 1997 is that year for me. Everything happened for me in 1997. So 1997, January 1997, back on the mountain, I'm studying colliding galaxies again. I'm at the same telescope, but I'm already a doctor. And I'm, I am in Rio, based in Rio. I have a fellowship from the government called the Young Doctor Fellowship, very prestigious. And here I am on the mountain observing colliding galaxies, trying to understand their chemical composition. So that's what was my project. And I was using that telescope that I knew really well. I was all by myself, it was during the night, and I was puzzled by something. I've always been a very curious person since I was a kid. I was a very curious kid, and I did not stop talking. My dad once told me he wanted to unplug me. <laughs> <laughs> so I could speak from. I've always been a storyteller since a kid, and now I'm back to the storytelling by talking to people like this. But the, the, when I was at this telescope, my curiosity drove me to a discovery that changed my life, because that discovery showed me again why I became an astronomer. So this is the discovery of a supernova. So when people find, oh, you discovered a star. No, I did not discover the star. I saw the death of a star. Ooh. Did you know that? So supernova is an explosion. The star blew up. The stars evolve. During their lifetime, depending if they're very massive, much bigger than the sun, they will have a short life, and they will blow up in a huge event, 
that they become so bright, so bright that you can see them from a very far away distance. So this is actually not the supernova, but the galaxy. It's a bit odd in shape. It's because it's a colliding galaxy, so they get all distorted by gravity. And when I was at that telescope, and I'm going to go back to it because I want to show you, um, I was using the teeny one here. That's how I discovered this one. <laughs> the teeny one here. Because this telescope does not take an image. The image you saw it wasn't taken with this telescope. This telescope has an instrument that will take the spectrum of the object. What does that mean? It means that the light will split in many, many ranges of wavelengths. And that will tell you the chemical composition of the object. So if you're observing a star, you can take the spectrum of a star, and you're going to know if the star has carbon, oxygen, and all the chemical elements you want to know, and how much they have. I was doing that with galaxies. So it's the entire stellar population, the chemical composition of the entire stellar population of a galaxy. So I um, had to pass that instrument through my galaxy. But because this does not have an imaging, doesn't take an image, you've got to use the little one. So the little one has a little tiny screen like this. It's like a TV screen. The TV screen shows only the stars in the field. So let's go back to here. I could see these stars. These stars are stars in the Milky Way, right here, nearby, but they're on the way, right? So they're in the foreground of the big galaxy in the background. That galaxy in the background is at 53.6 million light years away. What does it mean? It means that that day, that January 14, when I saw this object here, that object had exploded. That's why you can see it bright here, because the other stars you can't see, right? You can't see other stars here. So this one you can see because it just blew up. But it blew out up 53.6 million years ago. And the light arrived in my telescope that night, and I saw it. That's pretty cool, right? So just thinking about this, like, wow, this is awesome. So what did I do? I pointed the, the instrument towards that strange object that was not supposed to be there. Because when I counted the stars in the map I had in my hand, because I brought the maps, there was an extra star. So I spent like five minutes trying to convince myself that I was in the right field. And I did some triangulation, some calculation, something like really with a little rule or something. Wow, it's very close to the galaxy. I cannot see the galaxy in that little screen because it's too small, too faint. So I passed the instrument and I saw, and I waited, because you have to wait a few minutes until we collect the light. Meanwhile, who arrives? My boyfriend, who is my husband today. Uh, my boyfriend, this is 1997, all right? So um, he arrived because he was observing another telescope. He worked for the observatory at that time. He was going to bed, it was 1 a.m. more or less, because he works also during the day. So he came to bring me a sandwich. <laughs> so girls, pick up your boyfriend's right. <laughs> so um, he gave me, he brought me, he brought me a sandwich, it was 1 a.m. and I told him, oh, I think I discovered a supernova. And he said, are you kidding me? I said, no, wait, wait it's five minutes, wait. So he waited, and when we saw the results of the spectrum, which is, looks like this, right? All these peaks, each peak would be chemical element. But because the star exploded, these peaks are not so peaky. They're like, it's very crazy. <laughs> so we look at it and said, Whoa. the person in charge of the observatory to see what that was, because I did not work a supernova before. 
And he came, his name is Chris. Chris looked at it and said, oh, wow, congratulations, it is kind of super. I said, what? <laughs> How do you know? Maybe somebody seen it. He said, well, you know what? Uh, in the morning, you're lucky. In the morning, there is a person here, an astronomer, that you can talk to. He was a supernova. And he's going to tell you what you need to do. So I said, OK, nobody slept that night, of course, said, or the morning, because you sleep during the morning, right? But I don't sleep. So here I am, here I am at that cafeteria again, right? And here I looked for the, the Stefano Benetti's name, Stefano, Italian astronomer, it's a European observatory, right? I go to, the, to Stefano, Stefano is a man this, this tall, and I'm tall, so you can imagine how tall he is. So I look at him and I said, um, Chris told me that you could actually um, look at this and tell me what to do next, because I saw this last night. And then he said, oh, let me see it. And it, it's not this image, remember, it's just the thing and the little map I had. So he looked at it and said, oh, hey, congratulations, you discovered a supernova. And I said, really? Where's the catalog? Oh, let's see, it, there must be a catalog. How, how do I know for sure, I'm a scientist, right? How do I know for sure that I'm the first one to see it? And then he looked at me and he said, I am the catalog. <laughs> was the person who collected all discoveries of supernova in the world. And here I am, this really young doctor who said, who, 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 yeah, yeah. Anyway, yes, next move, he told me, now I'm sure I haven't seen this one. You're for sure the first one to see. So this is 1997D. D is not for Duilia. D is not for Demello. My dad got really upset with me about that when I explained to, me, to him that this was the fourth supernova of the year 1997, that's why it's D, A, B, C, D. So, I, um, that night, he told me, he was, uh, Stefano told me he was gonna come back, we're gonna reobserve it, and we're gonna write the telegram. I said, wow, that is cool, right? So he came, when he came, he already had this image. So he went to another telescope, took the image, took the photo, came back, and showed me, and I was like, whoa, that's when, I really realized this was my discovery. So um, this shows you how insecure one is, right? And I, I, even though I have been very strong and very good student and everything I do and everything, I could not believe I was the one who discovered. So in our days, when I go give talks, especially in Brazil, I show this. You know, social media is a problem, right? If you haven't realized that, um, the other day my sister told me, really, there's this guy on the internet telling everybody that you are a fake. Yeah. I'm a fake? <laughs> yeah, that he looked, he found no supernova, he found no NASA, he found no nothing, that you are a total fake. So no, this is the IAO telegram. He had the wrong supernova, he had the wrong name, he had the wrong, he wanted to enter NASA security sites, which are protected, you can't go in. And, <laughs> and um, he started spreading um, rumors on the internet because social media is a problem. So I bring this uh, old thing, so this is the telegram we wrote reporting the discovery of supernova 1997 that then became 1997D, they named it after that. Well, 1997, everything happens. Brazil was once again in one of the biggest crises. Every time Brazil enters in a crisis, it's the biggest, right? <laughs> so this is the biggest crisis. And uh, here I am, I told my mom I was gonna live out of astronomy. I was gonna be this Carl Sagan and all that. And um, the Brazilian government decided to cut everything in half for research. So I get a letter from the government saying that my funding, I, could, I have a choice. I could choose, instead of three years, a year and a half, or half of the salary for three years. So I made that piece of paper into a big pile of little papers. <laughs> <laughs> and I start looking for a job. I have met many people in my life. I'm very easygoing. I meet a lot of people, and I make friends. I start emailing people and say, I'm in the job market. If anybody wants to hire, please let me know. That's when I came here have mentors. So these are my mentors. So this man here is about Metin. 
is Klaus, Klaus Leiter. Klaus is an astronomer at the Space Telescope Science Institute. I had met him in a conference in Greece, and we, we got along and he worked in a field similar to colliding galaxies and all that. And then he told me, um, give me a phone number uh, and I'll call you when I said I was looking for a job, right? So he called me like right away, and then he offered me a job right away. And then he said, you know, when I, we met in Greece, you told me that um, you were not very um, keen of living in the US. I had said that. <laughs> <laughs> so I told him, oh, but so many years have passed, things are different, and I'm looking for different opportunities. And last year, I met this man. So I told him I had met Bob Williams. Bob Williams was the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute. He went to Brazil to give a talk, and I was sort of like his host because I spoke English. and and because I talk a lot. So, so I was his host, and he told me, oh, you should come to Baltimore. And I told him, Bob, I'm not going to the US. It's too competitive, I've done it. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not, no, I don't want to. He said, but you've never been to Baltimore. No, I have never been to Baltimore. How about DC? No, I haven't been to, I've been to many other places. And he said, oh, but you should come to Baltimore. Baltimore is different. It has diversity. He has culture. He was a big promoter of Baltimore. <laughs> and he made me curious. He made me curious, and that's important, right? So I did not dismiss that this was an interesting place to work. And I arrived here in April, so this was February, and April's already here. In April 1997, I arrived all by myself with two suitcases, and I never left. Well, I did leave. I went to Sweden, but that's another point. So, uh, <laughs> so I came in 1987, uh, and these two uh, scientists were my mentors, and they still are. And then I got married. 1997. By the way, this picture is taken by Klaus, who was our witness, and that's Tommy, when he still had a little hair. Uh, <laughs> and it's taken Federal Hill. Oh, because we had champagne. I know we can't have champagne, but we had. We had champagne cake, um, and that was our wedding. And um, Tommy left to Sweden a couple of months later. He would come and go. He, had, he was a professor in Sweden. He's Swedish. So we have what's famous in, in to say the two-body problem. <laughs> Very common in science. A lot of astronomers are married to astronomers, you know, first because we're a few women, so we have a large pool to choose. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, you know, choose it right, and you get it, you, you win the lottery. So, um, I decided, okay, I was gonna go to Sweden, and I went. So, I went to Sweden on a gender balance program. A gender balance program at Chalmers University had to increase women in science and engineering. And I had the best time and the worst time. Um, so I lived in Sweden from 99 to 2002 um, as a, a fellow and as an assistant professor at Shawmans University. Me in Sweden is boring. <laughs> I'm sorry. My husband knows. <laughs> so um, I did not particularly like Sweden. Tony is not particularly attached to Sweden either. So we decided that. Um, instead of always having that half an hour explanation when I complained about something, <laughs> we decided to live in a, in a neutral country, and that was the US. So, do not, and this is something that we need to work better on this, do not be afraid of changing your plans. So, sometimes things don't go as planned. I went to Sweden to grow roots. Did not work. It's cold. <laughs> Even in the summer. There is no night in the summer. There is no day in the winter. Come on. <laughs> Boring. So I was ready to come back to where there is life. <laughs> and we came back to Baltimore. So we still live in Federal Hill. Um, at that point, I started, I had a foot at Johns Hopkins until a few years ago. I was a visiting professor at Hopkins. Uh, but I came to NASA Goddard Space Flight Center on a project 
towards deep images of the universe where you see the end of the universe. That's what I've been doing in the past 14 years. Um, and Catholic University was my contractor at that time. And I worked for Catholic University at NASA Gada for five years until they invited me to teach. And that was the end of it. And I became a professor at Catholic University. I love what I do. And I became an inspiration to the next generation because I think it's our role to change our environment. So if astronomy has a lot of men, bring women. So that's what I've been doing. So I have um, a bunch of students that I have been collecting over the years, not just students, postdocs as well. Amber was a postdoc at NASA Gala, now she's a civil servant. It's a bunch of students of mine at some point worked with me or my, my, my PhD students. Promote them, promote the next generation. This is also very important. You can't just, you know, think that you brought them in and now they will blossom. No, you have to take them with you. And this is Amy. Amy Soto was my student, a PhD student. She's a doctor now. Uh, Amy, um, first generation Puerto Rican. Um, I, I call her fake Puerto Rican because she's from Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> Amy. Um, I was scared me when I told her we were going to do a selfie with Bob Williams, that director of the Space Telescope, but we did. Um, then I also introduced her to Nancy Grace Roman. Have you heard of Nancy? Nancy is the first executive director of NASA. She passed just last year. Nancy is an amazing role model for all of us women in science, and uh, she is immortal because she became a Lego figure. <laughs> I have it. I recommend it to find an, an, the four um, women uh, figures in the Lego, NASA Lego. Go look for it. It's really cool. So recruit, recruit, recruit. I do not believe if you build them, come. You have to go and get them. We, I recruit and I bring women to the physics department of our places, which is really not well known for having a lot of women. And if you look at this image, there are lots of women there, right? So we are half women, half males in, in the, the physics department at Catholic University. This is John Meadow, Nobel Prize of Physics, that I brought into his, his at Goddard to, to give a talk to, to our students. Promote diversity. I love this picture. It has a lot of diversity, including a bird. <laughs> <laughs> this is our, um, you know, Cardinal is, is the name of the team at Catholic University. We're not very good at sports. Um, but this picture has um, diversity in terms of ethnicity, in terms of gender and STEM, LGBT, and social levels. This was a program in Brazil started a few years ago and unfortunately ended. It lasted four years. Um, it promoted the diversity because it brought Brazilians to places that did not have Brazilians. And Brazilians can be of any type. We are a very mixed society. But we still have a long way to go in terms of promoting diversity. And this group has two uh, female engineers, which is amazing because there are not very many female engineers either. He has an uh, Afro-Brazilian engineer, who is Haisa, she's brilliant. And he has people from the south, from the deep south. He has people from the, up, from the north, from the poorest states of, of Brazil, and from uh, wealthy families as well. So it's a great mix of um, diversity here, and there's a bunch of them. So I had 80 of them. I feel like I gave birth to 80 people. <laughs> I have no kids of my own. So these are my kids. So I, uh, and again, I'm still their mentors. They have left the program ended three years ago already. So it went from 2012 to 2016, and we haven't had it anymore. Uh, but I still keep in contact with them, and I, I just thought, as you see, they're all smiling, right? So they're all Brazilians. They brought a lot of diversity to Catholic University and a lot of uh, uh, great uh, vibes to the, to the place. So this was uh, 2014. I got the prize of being the, the I forgot the name of my prize. <laughs> Professional of the Year, right? <laughs> Professional of the Year of 2013, but the prize was given in 2014. Here I am. Um, 
This is the minute, one of the ministers that gave the prize. This is the Minister of Industry and Commerce. And we're in Brasilia, in the capital of Brazil. And this is when Epoca Magazine called me the 100 most influential person of the year. So I had two years in my life, 1997 and 2014. I'm waiting for another of those years. <laughs> um, so um, I decided to test if I was really influential. So I opened the association Woman of the Stars. So since the discovery of the supernova, I've been known, because I give a lot of interviews, as the Woman of the Stars. So I um, started this program to try to find the dwellers in the fields, the dwellers that are in the place that have no access to education, to find talents to actually motivate them to study science, in particular girls. So, um, and I've been doing that. Um, here is a, one of my favorite days of my life. I went to a public school in the San Bernardo campus, a city outside the, the city of Sao Paulo, in an impoverished area, uh, and I gave a talk. When I entered, it's a little gym. They are sitting in the gym, a gym about the size. When I entered the gym, there were 500 little kids sitting down with their backpacks <coughs> in the back, waiting for me to arrive. When I came in, they started, yeah, and I started crying. So, <laughs> so they, they treated me like I was a rock star. And, I, and to me, that meant a lot, and it was, a, I said, wow, this is, this is what I wanted. This is exactly what I was born to do. So I've been going also to high school, not just, this is an elementary school, um, to um, high schools and universities as well. And I'm going to, I'm trying to finish up. Do I have a lot of time? Um, this is a letter I got from a little girl I translated here into English uh, in 2017. Hi, my name is Annie Graziele Suarez. I'm in the sixth grade at the Reds de Mare. You must know. I actually did know because I had been there, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. I have so many questions. One, is there life on Mars? <laughs> Two, do you know Curiosity? Curiosity is this rover on Mars, right? Does NASA have a lot of technology? Do you work with research? Do you know any scientists? Do you know the president of the United <laughs> States? <laughs> it was really nice, in talking, nice talking to you. This is Annie. So I wrote to the teacher who wrote me some of this via email. And I said, OK, I got to go there and see Annie. So I did. When I got to Heads of the Mare, I'll tell you what Mare is. Um, this is a map of Rio. I'm, I'm from this region of Rio. Nobody knows this, because this is really in the um, bad neighborhoods of Rio. Uh, so here um, is the airport. Here is a, a big road that when you get to, to the airport, you go into the city. So the city is like, oh, we are here. So, um, and this is the Mare. Um, it's a, it's a com I would say, community of um, 130,000 people, but it is uh, a slum, okay? So uh, a community that lives uh, marginalized, uh, their streets didn't even have signs or names. So it's really an impoverished area of Rio. And because I studied here too, I knew very well this region, and I'm not scared of going there. Most of Brazilians are. So um, this is a, a picture of, of Maria. Uh, you have uh, tanks here because uh, recently, and it's actually just last year, um, the government sent the army there to calm things down. It's a lot of drugs, a lot of prostitution, a lot of troubles in that community. There's a community made of people just like us. So uh, Annie is one of the little girls that lives here, and I went to see her. The day I got to the, to the little school, it's a little school for after, after school. So you go to public school in the morning, and then in the afternoon, it's, a, it's actually a non-profit organization called Mare, Heads da Mare, and they um, take care of the kids during the day. Um, and I got there, I, I, you know, Uber won't enter, taxis won't enter here. So the access is really hard to get there. So um, the way I do it, I get out on the bus stop on the avenue way out there, and then um, the teachers come and get me with their cars because the cars are allowed to go in. So because then the, the drug lords know them. So I go, I, I went to, uh, to this place, my second time there, I get there, and it's not there. 
So the, the teacher told me, oh, do we, we almost had to cancel with you today. I don't know if you heard about the shootings last night. And I said, no, I didn't. And I didn't look at the news. So she said, well, we had a lot of shootings. And uh, Anne's mother is a little scared of sending her out. So, but we, we've been trying to get her here because you're here. So Anne came. So uh, here, I'm going to show you a picture first of the group of students. They're amazing. There they are. So uh, they love selfies, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the teacher, actually. And uh, uh, a variety of ages, because they combined classes for my one presentation. I brought my meteorites to show them. I have one here in my ring, if anybody wants to see my meteorite. Given by my super husband. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So here we go. Anne is right here. And here she is. <laughs> so this is the little girl that wrote that letter. Can you believe it? It's amazing, right? So I asked Anne, Anne, have you been to the planetarium? Rio has one of the best planetariums in the world. And Anne said, no, I don't go out very much. Well, we know why, right? So um, my association organized a trip for them. So we collected money, we rented the bus, and they went. So here are they at the planetarium in Rio, where it says inspiring the next generation to follow their, ta their talents. Um, it means love in Portuguese. And it's Association Mulher das Estrelas, so AME. So um, here's Annie. She's very short. So you can see that she's <laughs> tip <-top. laughs> And here's Anne learning about rockets. So, uh, so this is the kind of work that we've been doing the past few years with kids. Uh, I've been to many, many schools in Brazil. Um, Isabel is my witness here. Gosh, you travel a lot. Yeah, I do travel a lot. I've been to Brazil to spend a day to give a talk. And it's been very, very rewarding. More than 30,000 people have heard me talking since that year that the magazine told me that I was influential. And uh, the impact is huge. So this is the large stock of my life. Uh, 6,000 people, 6,000 high school students went to see my talk. And when I entered, and I said, hi, I'm Duila de Mello. I'm an astrophysicist. They all start applauding. And, and it was amazing. I never thought this was to happen in my life. And I did feel like a rock star. <laughs> So um, then uh, life brings you great joys sometimes. It's not always easy. And it's never been very easy for me in particular. But this was one day that I said, it's been worth doing what I do. This is the club that um, Isabel mentioned earlier, that it's a club that was named. It's an astronomy club in a school in the middle of nowhere in Brazil. And they call it Clube. Gastronomia do Ilha de Mel. So they had choices who they could name, and they chose a woman, they chose me. So I was very flattered, and I have, of course I had to go see them, and I did. <laughs> so here I am. Uh, so this shirt is the, actually it's kind of the uniform of the club, and they sent it to me. Can you believe this? I have that t-shirt. I almost came today, but then I said, no, it's a little, it needs to wash. <laughs> so, um, so these are the, the kids that are inspired by the Mulher das Estrelas, by my story, by the story I'm telling you. And I hope, uh, I don't want Brazil to have millions of astronomers, of course not. Um, we want them to care for science, to be curious, and to actually understand scientific method and have critical thinking. And I hope this is the message that they are getting from us, from uh, my association. And then I became sort of um, public figure, so every once in a while I find a cartoon that's supposed to be me, and this is me, and I have a cape. <laughs> so, um, here is some drawing that a kid did, and it's supposed to be me. It has stars in the skirt. My mom said she was going to make me a skirt like this. My mom is 81 years old. So here is a, a bunch of um, physics students giving talks about women in science, and they made t-shirts, and that's me. So, um, and here's a cartoon where they talk about the woman of the stars, and this is me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, do I tell the fortune? No. Am I a genius? No. But the internet thinks so. <laughs> so, 
So I've been named genius number five of Brazil. <laughs> so if you want to impress somebody today, you tell them, I met genius number five of Brazil. <laughs> and it's a woman. <laughs> and a scientist. So is the sky the limit? No. The limit, you make your own limit. Uh, my mom doesn't think the li it's the limit either. And I'm going to finish now showing a bunch of pictures of my mom and me. <laughs> and at the end is my mom in front of the International Space Station showing that the sky is not the limit. <laughs> Thank you very much.